In this lesson, we introduced the theta method, which was a method that was successful, in fact, successful enough to be the winner of a previous competition, the M3 competition. It's a relatively simple method, although its original derivation is fairly convoluted. And in fact, once you stand the card method, you'll actually notice that there are similarities between the theta method and the card method, although the card method is substantially more complicated. In fairness, the theta method was derived in the late 1990s when computational power was substantially more limited, and so forecasting competitions had to use much simpler models. We'll see this method is closely related to simple exponential smoothing, but instead of using one of the standard exponential smoothing models, for example, Holt or SES, it will combine SES with a more standard traditional trend model. There's a single parameter, theta. This is not something that is going to be estimated. It's, you can think of it as part of the model itself. The standard choice is to use two thetas, theta equals zero and theta equals two, and to equally weight the forecasts that come from these two choices of theta. So again, we assume we observe series xt from t equals one to cap t. Just like always, there's the issue of whether you should model the level or the logs. In general, if a series is non-negative, it will make sense to model the logs. If a series is mixed, then one would model the level itself. The idea here that underlies this thing is to transform the data into a surrogate series, to forecast the surrogate series, and then to finally recover the forecast of the original series from forecasts of the surrogate series. The process gets its name from this idea that the surrogate series, that is delta, the second difference of yt of theta, should be equal to a parameter theta times the second difference of xt. So in other words, you double difference the data, you then scale it by some number theta, and then you think about building a model using these alternative versions of x that will look like the original data as close as possible. So in fact, with this structure, one can actually show that the levels of the series are gonna be related to yt as yt of theta. It's gonna depend on two constants, t minus one, which is just a standard time trend, and then theta times xt. So you can see that xt will generally appear in the series but it will be damped or possibly exaggerated depending on the value of theta. This yt of theta is known in the original paper as the theta line. In order to estimate these two parameters of the model, the alpha and the beta, the suggestion is to use OLS. So what we want to do is fit a theta line to match as closely as possible to the original series. So in other words, we're going to use least squares between the observed value xt, which again could be logged or levels, and the theta line. So we see the problem is simply xt minus alpha theta minus beta theta times the time trend. These are the two parameters that we care about. And then we have minus theta xt, all squared. That turns out to be equivalent to fitting an OLS of 1 minus theta times xt, on alpha theta and beta theta. Since those are the only two unknown parameters, it doesn't actually matter. This idea that sort of this yt is there is not particularly important. And so all we're gonna do is fit the trend to a damped version of xt. And in fact, the solution to the problem is completely analytical. So one can see that a hat of theta is one minus theta times x bar minus b hat of theta times cap t minus one over two, and b hat of theta is just this particular form here. This is nothing but OLS. These are just the analytical expressions of what you get in an in a OLS of on a constant and a single regressor, which in this case is the time trend. So in practice, when you wanna estimate a hat of theta and b hat of theta, you're simply gonna construct the matrix one, 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 and then zero, one, two, all the way through kept t minus one. Those are the two things you regress on and the coefficients you get from that OLS will be A and B. The original forecast suggests forecasting xt plus h given t as one half times 
two theta lines, that is the theta line for 0 and the theta line for 2. The theta line for 0 is particularly simple since x doesn't actually appear. And so we simply have a standard time trend line there with no x. This is very similar to what we saw in the card or what we will see in the card depending on how you watch the lectures for the so-called delta method. Although again, it's not nearly as sophisticated or robust. The second method has the idea that one will forecast yt plus h given t for the second theta line, a theta line with theta 2, as a simple exponential smoother of the fitted values of the y t minus i again for theta 2, and then with an initial value yi of 2. So at the end of the day, this is just a standard SES, but not using the original x's, but instead using the y's that you get from the theta line when theta is equal to 2. But both of these are direct and simple to forecast, so there's nothing particularly challenging here. But it's possible to gain a few further insights into the model. And in fact, one can show that these two expressions can be equivalently written in a slightly, in fact, easier to work with way as two parts. First is this x tilde t plus h given t. And the second one is what at the end of the day we're going to see is going to be a damped trend. So you have this b naught term, b naught hat term. You then have, see, h appears there. So the longer horizon you get, it's going to be larger. Instead of just being the trend times the horizon, there's going to be some additional terms here. And in particular, if we think of the alpha, which is the SES parameter, that is the parameter that comes from a simple exponential smoothing, if that parameter is somewhere between 0 and 1, then we can see that this damping, or what's going to happen here, is this additional term is going to tend to reduce the effect of the trend relative to having an alpha say that was equal to 1. If alpha is 1, then most of this term cancels, and you just left with h. The second part of the forecast, though, is to look at this x tilde t plus h. That turns out to be just a completely standard SES for the original data. So this is just the original x data. So you don't need to do any sort of fitting of the theta line or anything. In fact, the only thing you actually need to operationalize these forecasts is to have an estimate of beta naught hat and to have estimate of alpha. So the two parameters of the model are going to be b naught and alpha. So b naught will be estimated as part of an OLS. Alpha will be estimated to fit the SES of x. So those are the two choices that one needs to do to implement this forecasting model, or the two parameters one needs to estimate to implement the forecasting model. To understand the model a little bit further, it can actually be shown that there is an assumed data generating process where this particular forecast, which is the theta method for two particular values of theta, that is it uses the average of theta equals 0 and 2, can be shown to be an optimal forecast if the underlying model is an integrated moving average. So there's the integration term, there's the moving average term with a time trend. So this is what we call a drift, but in practice it means that the series is growing over time, where b is the time trend. This is not quite the same as b naught on the previous slide. In fact, it can be shown that b is equal to b naught over 2 from the previous slide. And so from this, it's very easy to get the one-step forecast. So the one-step by forecast, of course, just the final value of xt plus a single iteration of b, the moving average term, which is alpha minus 1 times epsilon t. One can actually get the multi-step forecast by inverting the moving average, like we saw before. So I simply know that epsilon t is xt minus xt minus 1 minus b minus alpha minus 1 epsilon t minus 1. I can sub in for epsilon t minus 1, which I solved backwards, and just plug that in. And if one continues to do that for a few steps, one is going to see you're going to get exactly two components. So one of the components is going to be a simple exponential smoother for xt. That's the same as we saw on the previous slide. The second component, which is here, 
is going to be exactly the damp trend that we had on the previous slide, then there is an epsilon 1. And if we just assume that to be 0, that makes life easier. And so the multi-step forecast only depends on these two components. We saw the relationship before, so that when I want to have this multi-step forecast, that one can get the one step ahead, again, has this sort of relatively straightforward expression here. One step ahead depends on the SES, plus then this relationship there, a longer horizons. You still get an H there, which reflects the fact this is a trend. You have the SES, again, it's the one step SES. It's important to note that it's the one step SES because it simply comes from the fact that we know for SES models that x hat t plus h given t is equal to x hat t plus 1 given t. That is, the forecasts for SES are always a random walk, and so once one has the one step ahead forecast, there's nothing else to do. But then we get that we need to add in this trend. So the theta of the theta forecasting method, in fact, is optimal for an integrated moving average with a time trend. We can see from this expression that alpha hat is close to 1. Then the time trend is simply b times h. If alpha hat is somewhat less than 1, then that's going to particularly, you can assume t is large, so we can sort of ignore this last term. It's not particularly important. Then if alpha is less than 1, say alpha was 1 half, then that's going to have an impact on the trend because you're going to see that that term appears here. It also suggests that rather than use the two-step approach that we suggested before, where you use OLS to estimate B naught hat, and you use SES to estimate alpha hat, one can actually estimate all of the parameters of the model simply by using maximum likelihood and the moving average model. Delta XT has a constant and an MA1. So in other words, an MA1 plus a constant will give us MLEs of B and alpha, in which case then we can generate our forecasts optimally using the output of that model. And that, in fact, will be the same as the theta line using theta equals 2 and theta equals 0. This lecture has introduced the theta method, which in practice is simple to implement. It combines a simple exponential smoother with a linear time trend. There are two key parameters, B0 and alpha. One is usually estimated by OLS, the other is estimated using SES, although we saw at the end that it's possible to jointly estimate the two parameters using maximum likelihood estimation. The practical gain of this method is that it provides sort of a random walk forecast for the cyclical component, but also adds a time trend that is not as random as one would get if you used Holtz method. In particular, it's going to be more stable over long horizons, which may be an advantage in practice over using pure exponential smoothing.